Hello guys, welcome back to the Tutor Med channel where everything medicine is simplified. In this video, we will continue with our discussion on chest pain of cardiac origin, part 2. The link to the first video is on the top right of your screen as shown and in the video description below. I strongly recommend that you watch that before continuing with this video. Alright, let's get started. Alright guys, let's review the main pathologies of the coronary arteries which can cause myocardial ischemia. The most common pathology is atherosclerosis. This is the thickening or hardening of the endothelial lining caused by buildup of fatty or cholesterol plaques and this buildup reduces the lumen size of the artery as shown in this diagram. The artery on the left represents the normal while the artery on the right is a diseased one showing the atheromatous plaques. When the size of the plaque is able to occlude at least 70% of the lumen size, chest discomfort may ensue, especially during exertion and emotional distress or duress. These are states which increase myocardial oxygen demand. When this happens, a condition called stable angina pectoris is diagnosed or is suspected. Sometimes, the plaque may rupture and can be a substrate for thrombus or clot formation and this clot can partially or totally occlude the lumen, resulting in a non-exertional chest discomfort, a condition known as acute coronary syndrome. We will review this later in the video. Now the factors which predispose to atherosclerosis are called cardiovascular risk factors. These factors can either be modifiable or non-modifiable. Their presence in the history strengthens the defense for myocardial ischemia as a culprit of the patient's chest pain. And so let's look at these risk factors briefly, beginning with the non-modifiable risk factors. 1. is male sex and then advanced age typically above 65. If the patient is of African descent or race, if there is a family history, particularly premature cardiovascular disease like ischemic heart disease in any first degree relative less than 55. A first degree relative here can be the sister or the siblings or the parents. Now for the modifiable risk factors, we have poorly controlled hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, significant cigarette smoking, dyslipidemia, obesity, which is BMI more than 30, physical inactivity, chronic kidney disease, especially the end-stage kidney disease, stage 5, and alcohol abuse, just to mention a few. Apart from atherosclerosis, the following are pathologies of the coronary artery which can also result in myocardial ischemia. 1. You can have an embolus in the coronary artery which can block the lumen. Coronary artery microvascular disease like we established earlier. Sometimes there is no obstruction within the lumen but the walls are undergoing spasms, vessel spasms. Then you can have coronary artery dissection in association with aortic dissection. Then you can have myocardial bridging where the artery goes through the substance of the myocardium and so when the myocardium is contracting, it compresses on the artery. 
then you can have coronary artery fibrosis, which is scarring of the artery, reducing the lumen. Then you can have coronary arteritis, inflammation of the walls of the artery, reducing the lumen. And so now that we are done establishing the basic sciences and principles, we will look at how a diagnostic history is taken when evaluating a patient with a suspected cardiac pain. From our history taking lecture, remember the five C's of a diagnostic history, it will be applied here. Ensure you take a full history from the patient's demography to the family history, but aim that by the end of the ODQ, the diagnosis should be apparent. And so the focus of our history will be on the patient's demography, the presenting complaints and its duration, the HPC, and the ODQ. To review the five C's of a diagnostic history, remember that the HPC constitutes the first three C's. The first C being the characteristics of the presenting complaint, which in this case is likely to be angina pectoris or chest discomfort and so we'll use Socrates to characterize it. The other two C's are the cause of the presenting complaint and the care of the presenting complaint. Then the ODQ has the last two C's, the cause of the presenting complaint. And to establish that, we need to note the symptoms and the risk factors in the history. And that will point to the cause of the presenting complaint. And the last C, is the complications of the working diagnosis, which in this case might be acute coronary syndrome. And it can be complicated by heart failure. And so we need to note that in the history as well. But to get more information on the medical history taking, kindly visit that lecture. For ischemic cardiac pain like stable angina pectoris, acute coronary syndrome, microvascular angina, etc., our work can be made easier by remembering that they share some characteristics and so we do not need to learn their individual features. All we need to know is their distinguishing features. And so for stable angina and ACS, this is how the typical history is going to be like. For demography, typically you are going to get an elderly or a middle-aged patient, man or woman. A presenting complaint, chest pain of short duration. Then the history of presenting complaints, we begin with the characteristics of the presenting complaints. We are going to use Socrates. For the site, it is usually going to be central and diffuse. Then the onset, gradual, the character, constricting, squeezing, tightness, heaviness. Then radiation sites to the left arm or both arms, to the neck, lower jaw, epigastrum. Then the associated symptoms usually are the anginal equivalents like nausea and or vomiting, diaphoresis, atypical pain sites, belching. And for the timing, typically stable angina lasts two to five minutes, while acute coronary syndrome lasts more than 10 to 20 minutes. And for exacerbations, activity or exertion worsens stable angina, but this is not so in ACS. Then the severity, usually severe enough to impair activities of daily living, ADLs. Now let's look at some distinguishing features. Activity precipitates stable angina, whilst ACS occurs at rest or with very mild activity. Then R for the relieving factors, nitrates relieve stable angina but rarely relieves the pain of acute coronary syndrome. And so the acronym PRED can be used to remember these distinguishing features. P for the precipitating factors, R for the relieving factors, E for the exacerbations and then D for the duration. Then we come to the ODQ which seeks to establish the cause of the presenting complaint and then any complications arising from it. And so to get the cause, we want to know the symptoms and the risk factors like 
established before. So here you would notice that the symptoms have already been established mostly in the HPC. And so we move to the risk factors including poorly controlled hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, significant degree smoking, family history of a first degree relative with premature ischemic heart disease, physical inactivity. You will bear with me that most of these questions, for example, the hypertension and diabetes should be asked in the past medical history and then cigarette smoking in the social history. However, if questions are relevant to making diagnosis, it is allowed to bring them into the indirect questioning. After establishing the cause, we need to ascertain whether there are possible complications from the primary problem. So for example, if the primary pathology is myocardial infarction, then complications like heart failure should be ascertained. Questions like orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea should be asked. It can also cause acute kidney injury. And so questions like decreased urine volume or oliguria should be asked. However, the conditions which make up acute coronary syndrome, like unstable angina, and stem and STEMI may not be distinguished from each other clinically. And here, the ECG and cardiac troponins may help. And based on the ECG, you will find that unstable angina and NSTEMI make up the non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, while the STEMI is the ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Alright guys, I want to believe that this aspect of history taking as far as chest pain of cardiac origin is concerned makes sense. And so what are some of the physical examination findings? 1. The patient may be seen in pain showing the levine sign. And here, the patient clenches his fist and puts it on the central chest or the precordium. There may be signs of respiratory distress like increased respiratory rate, flaring of the ala nasi, intercostal recessions. There may be anginal equivalent signs like excessive sweating or diaphoresis. And there may be cardiovascular risk signs like the patient may be obese, there may be nicotine staining of the fingers, there may be cholesterol deposits in the skin, xanthomata and in the eyelids, xanthelesma, as shown by these diagrams. Again, myocardial ischemia can cause tachycardia and hypertension, or the hypertension noted can be the cardiovascular risk factor which predisposed to the ischemia. Another sign is that there may be new heart sounds and murmurs, one of them including paradoxical splitting of the second heart sound. Now in the normal patient, there may be a physiological splitting of the second heart sound. The simplest explanation is that the second heart sound occurs as a result of closure of the pulmonic and aortic valves. And the aortic valve may close earlier than the pulmonic valve and this is normal. But for a patient with a left ventricular ischemia or infarction, there may be a split and this split is due to the pulmonic valve closing earlier than the aortic valve. That is, we have the reverse pattern, hence the term paradoxical splitting. And this occurs because the ischemia led to a delay in left ventricular relaxation or diastole. Second, there may be a pansystolic murmur for, from sorry, a mitral regeg. And this is due to papillary muscle rupture or dysfunction. And you know that the valves are supported by the gaudy tendini which are connected to the papillary muscle. So if they rupture, the valves may be incompetent.